You're listening to the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast. Welcome to the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast, where we talk to interesting people and hear stories from this misunderstood, heart-shaped country in Southeast Europe. Today, I chat with Peter Korchnak, who lives in Washington State in the USA and publishes the very successful Remembering Yugoslavia podcast. With a nine-hour difference between us, I get to find out the what, why and how about Peter's podcast that's based on how people of the former Yugoslavia both remember and imagine their homeland. So, first off, who is Peter Korchnak? You're listening to the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast. The most important questions of all time. So, my name is Peter Korchnak, as you mentioned. In Slovak, I pronounce it Peter Korchnak, uh, which the H sound is, is hard to pronounce for, uh, for English speakers. Uh, anyways, I am from a country that no longer exists, uh, Czechoslovakia. That's where I was born. That's where I spent the first, uh, what is it now, first third of my life, maybe a little more at this point. You know, over time, I've become, for various reasons, I guess we, we get, get into that. Uh, very interested and fascinated with the former Yugoslavia, the other country, nearby country that no longer exists. Uh, I am educated as a business person, marketing professional, and a writer, both for myself, for, <laughs> for the drawer, you know, the proverbial uh, things that no one has seen yet or will never see, uh, as well as for various publications, including the local newspaper. I'm working on a couple of other things uh, related to former Yugoslavia. And of course, I write the podcast scripts for the Remembering Yugoslavia podcast. For somebody that has the background that you do, what made you want to create a podcast, as you say, about a country that no longer exists? Well, I'll start with the subject matter, right? Yugoslavia. So obviously, I am from the other disappeared country, vanished country, country that no longer exists. And as a child growing up in uh, then communist or socialist Czechoslovakia, I always wanted to go to Yugoslavia. Uh, it was always a country where there was the sea, you know, the ice cream was so much better than ours, the Balkan ice cream. And it was just a kind of a idealized land, idealized paradise, so to speak. But I never got to. I never got to go there for a number of reasons, one of them being the cost, the other being uh, the permit. So when you wanted to travel anywhere from Czechoslovakia, you had to apply and obviously receive, be granted a uh, an exit permit. The one for Yugoslavia was the most difficult to get. And I didn't know this at the time, but on both, both my mother's and father's side, some relatives had emigrated to the United States, which illegally, which was a big no-no. And so my guess or my, uh, my contention is that they were considered a, a risk. Yugoslavia at the time was very, you know, very much more open than Czechoslovakia was. And so a lot of people used that country to as a kind of a way station or a way to escape to the West, way to leave, emigrate from Czechoslovakia. And so we never got to go. Of course, 1989 comes, all comes down, Velvet Revolution in my country. You know, war breaks out in Yugoslavia a couple of years later. So by the time I could travel, uh, Yugoslavia no longer existed. It was, parts of it were not quite visitable, so to speak. And so I, for the first time, basically went to any of the, the remnant or successor countries in 1988 to Croatia. There was still um, very visible damage from the war, military vehicles, international, including international ones, you know, running around. So anyway, I loved it. Then in college, this, this was already in college. Then in college, I started meeting people while traveling from the region, made really good friends, started traveling to Belgrade in the late 90s, wrote my thesis at master's, at the master's program at Central European University, comparing the two dissolutions, comparing the dissolution of Czechoslovakia, and we learned a lot from Yugoslavia, comparing the dissolution of Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. From there on, you know, that was kind of solidified the interest. You know, of course, there's the cultural element, the movies of uh, Emir Kusturica of old, particularly underground, and it just kind of went from there. And then life intervened. I met the love of my life and uh, while studying, moved to the United States, kind of put Yugoslavia on hold, so to speak, but Yugoslavia kept coming back. She did not put me on hold. And so at some point I resumed or picked it back up as a kind of a passion and uh, continuing to explore uh, everything. And of course, by then the memory of the country has evolved. You know, I, I saw that the discourse is different from, you know, decade and a half back when I had been, you know, researching. And so I just became fascinated more with the memory of the country rather than the dissolution or the just pure history and found podcasting during the pandemic actually to be a good way to capture 
hear some of those stories. Podcasting, I think, is the to-go to platform at the moment. You know, it takes some technical skills to make a podcast really listenable. In some ways, it's slightly more difficult than it is to make a vlog. I think it's a lot easier just to show people what is going on. But to be a practitioner in what I like to call the theatre of the mind takes a certain different level of creativity. How difficult was it for you? I mean, you're, as you say, there you are as a writer, you have this passion you know, to craft something in pure audio form from scripts to mixing and everything else. Was it difficult for you to acquire those skills or are you one of those rare individuals where it sort of like comes pretty easy? I enjoy learning new things. I I don't like sitting still, uh, as my (laughs) wife would testify. And I always want to learn new things, always want to go further, explore deeper, etc. And so writing is awesome. It's uh, actually much more difficult than many people realize for me anyways. And so once I realized, okay, podcasting might be the route to go, I basically just researched, looked into how it works technically, what equipment you need, what kind of process you need to follow in order to produce a piece of audio recording, looked into different formats. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll see there are different formats of the of, of episodes. And so I just, and just went from there and just played around and tried to figure out the best way to do it. You know, there's information online about all this. I was uh, exploring podcasting some maybe 12 years ago when it first kind of emerged when blogging was big. So I was I was an avid blogger and I still occasionally dabble. And podcasting was this new thing. And I actually will confess that when I was invited to co-produce a podcast with somebody, this was kind of a business uh, business side of things when I when I was running my own marketing organization. I said, ah, you know, I don't I don't see a future in podcasts. That's like it's just too much work for the the outcome or for the you know too too low of an ROI, you know. And I think the medium has evolved. We read less, we consume in images, we consume and audio more video obviously i could not do video for some reason that just seems like a big mental barrier and like something i don't want to do but again it's just research online learning the best practices from others and i will say that writing is actually a big part of podcasting for me i record conversations i edit tightly i edit quite a bit and then craft these conversations craft these interviews into into narratives about the about the topic so i want to learn about the topic i want to explore the topic and then invite people to help me explore and help me go deeper help me go further thanks for listening listening to our podcast. If you would like to support us and the production of future episodes, then please consider maybe buying us a coffee. The link to do that is in the show notes for this podcast. Who are your main audience? What would you say is your typical listener? I don't know if there's a typical one, but there have been a, a few surprises. You know, when I first started out, and I still consider it a passion project, so something that I do no matter what. Put it out there, publish it, and then, you know, promote it on some channels, on social media, etc., and then see what I see what happens. But I just kind of, to be honest, didn't care. And I assumed that most people will be like me. You know, I was trying to talk to people like me, people who are interested in Yugoslavia, wherever they are, whether it's people like you who are in the country, people outside, doesn't matter. Of course, I expected that people who are from the former Yugoslavia would be interested as well. Now, what's happened has been people who are children or grandchildren of people from the region. So people exploring their family history or the history of the country that their parents or grandparents are from, who don't know much, you know, they, they know, oh, my parents were born there or here or there or whatever I don't know much they want to they want to just learn more and explore a lot of people kind of almost getting in touch with their yugoslav self so to speak or the yugoslav part of their identity and so that's been a kind of a very interesting and fascinating and in many ways the most heartfelt segment peter you cover historical things current topics even down to food and one of the things that you know is my love hate relationship here and it depends on the time of year and that time of year is from november right through to february when you have death by sarma and you had a, a really good episode there about sarma as well as talking about it do you have a passion for eating the food from the region yes. as well so i would say one of the just to comment on what you said earlier uh one one of the reasons why I go and I enjoy being there, you probably you do too, is food. And you know, the, some of it, some of it comes with a sense to me with a sense of privilege. You know, when I would first start to travel, you know, I always seem to have had disposable income to travel and be there. And so, absolutely, a lot of people, as and as you know, there are some episodes I've done and I will do in the future about the exodus of people from the from the countries of former Yugoslavia. People are trying to leave. There are people who are trying to stay and fight in a good way, not in a 
armed way and make their societies, make their cultures, make their countries better. There is a le level or there is a, I'm always aware and sometimes painfully aware of a, of a kind of uh, a privilege that I have as someone who is not from there to begin with, even though I'm from a central uh, European country that experienced the worst socialism at the time. There's that part of it that kind of always is in the back of mind or, or ever present or a little, little devil on the shoulder or whatever. But the food is one of the reasons I like going uh, because it's, it seems to me there's much higher importance placed on food as part of the culture. Like food is, is much more embedded in some ways in, in, in cultures. Mention Sarma, that's home to so many people wherever they are around the world who are from that area, you know? And so if I have my national food is much less diverse in, in many ways, but if I have Brinza Behalushki, I don't feel that way necessarily. Like, yeah, it's something from my culture. It's something from my country or even other, you know, traditional dishes, I don't feel that same way that people from that region feel about sarma or about bura, some of, some of the other, other dishes. And so the embeddedness of food in the culture is really fascinating to me. I try to capture some of that. This is a question that I'm sure there'll be a pause, and rightfully so. Of all the episodes so far in the Remembering Yugoslavia podcast, what episode are you most proud of? Do you, do you have a favorite, one that you particularly think, wow, I hit the mark there? There are actually two types. One is where there's a narrative, when there's a story, where there's, uh, you know, point A to point B. For example, the episode about the Yugoslav male art. So the, the artist from Uruguay who lives in Slovenia, who discovered some male artists, you know, explored that, that history and where things are now. So that's the kind of a narrative, like almost like revealing a mystery, right? The story of the Galaxia computer where a Croat living in New York decided to build the Galaxia computer for himself and, and you know, explored the Yugoslav Slav computer IT industry through that. that that was that was fascinating so I like I really like exploring a kind of a narrative really narrative rather than just subject matter the other type and I have fewer of those are the kind of on-site the travel ones like when I went to mini Yugoslavia I spoke with the current director and the founder and you know toured the place and was able to report from the place and so the other one was the other favorite and this actually probably would be my favorite because this was the reason why I went to the region for my first trip as part of this project was to go to the Dan Republica, the Day of the Republic celebration in Yaitse. And so I recorded a bunch of footage there, interviews, etc. Afterwards as well, made it into kind of a narrative. And that was really my, my. I would have to talk myself into saying that this is, uh, this is probably my, one of my favorites because it has both the story, it has the on the ground reporting. And so it makes me just kind of reminds me that the upcoming trip that I'm taking, this will be this will be the kind of the core of, of what I do there for the podcast. Try to record from location and bring those places closer to the listener. Because it's one thing, it's one thing to speak with people virtually remotely over X number of time zones. And it's another to be there and record the ambient sound, the crowds and the trams and the cars going by and stuff, stuff like that. Those would be my favorite. You know, I, I can't I can't say who's the best or who's the favorite, unfortunately. I was going to talk about future plans, but you've alluded already that, you know, you're coming back to the region. Do you have any focus points already in mind in the plan? Yes. So as that first was the Dan Republica, the focus of this one is Dan Mladosti. So the Day of Youth commemoration or celebration in Kumrovets, Croatia, now Croatia. That's the focal point. That's actually right at the very end, a couple of days before I leave, very end of the trip. So I look forward to that. I will stay in Belgrade for almost two weeks and then just kind of really road trip it through the area. And of course, food. I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat a lot and, and uh, enjoy it. Enjoy the heck out of it. You know, burek for breakfast, lunch and dinner type thing sometimes. Peter, it's been a, an absolute blast talking to you. And as I say, for people that are listening, you must check out and there'll be links in the show notes below to Peter's fantastic podcast, which is Remembering Yugoslavia. You'll get to find out information that you didn't know. And I have to say to you as well, Peter, that I pick up nuggets out of the podcast and I drop them in over dinner here. And I seem to come off as being the expert my cover gets blown very quickly when they ask the follow-up question and i said well I, I don't remember hearing that but um yeah it's been a blast having you here today thank you so so much for giving uh, up your time and um 
yeah, if we can get together, it'd be nice to sit down with some ambience, with a pivo. I know you shouldn't really broadcast or record when drinking, but heck. They- I look forward to trying that out. I, I want to do that. Like, hey, uh, how and- does, you know the show Drunk History, uh, the TV show? That's basically, they're telling a history story, but they're increasingly, the host or whoever and the guest, they get increasingly drunk. And so they're basically telling the story and it just becomes this funny, funny thing. So maybe I'll do a Drunk History uh, Remembering Yugoslavia podcast episode. Okay. Stay safe wherever you are. Let's hope that um, thank you things can progress as we want. And uh, yeah, stay safe, mate. That's Peter Korchnak from the Remembering Yugoslavia podcast. To find out more about Peter and his podcast, please do check out the show notes that accompany this podcast. Also, please do leave a review and share this podcast with friends or anyone who you think might be interested. Until next time then, please do stay safe wherever you are. And thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you would like to support us and the production of future episodes, then please consider maybe buying us a coffee. The link to do that is in the show notes for this podcast. Thanks again and see you next time.